Okay, what about Xers? And this really sets the stage for millennials because they're the ones coming after. Generation X, it's an interesting name, isn't it? Kind of a non-label label. And many uh, Xers, uh, I t often tell Xers, that's the one thing they have in common is that they don't think they belong to a single generation. And that just makes them even more mad, you know. I say that's, that's why they're a generation. They get all mad. Um, also, I think Xers, Xers um, have this feeling that there's always been this prediction of collective doom holding, hanging over their generation. So the only way to get ahead is not to belong to that generation. I, uh, when, when Bill Clinton came to the White House in 1992, uh, in early 1993, I, I interviewed many of the exes he, he brought with him, and I asked them all. I said, uh, what, you know, tell me about your generation. And their first response was, I don't belong to that generation. I come from a good family. You know, I mean, that, that, was, the ins <laughs> that was the instinctive response. Um, we, we often, in our own writing, have called them America's 13th generation. They're literally the 13th in a row since the first U.S. generation of Sam Adams and Benjamin Franklin. We also sometimes call them a generation wearing shades. Anytime a boomer comes up to ask one of those principled probing questions, the Xer can put on those Ray-Ban sunglasses, those reflecting sunglasses. That way the Xer gets to keep his privacy, the boomer gets to look at himself. That makes everyone happy. You see how that works? Um, but, but really, we also, we, also call them, we also call them 13th because of the bad luck and ill timing of their life cycle. I mean, think about it. Childhood is becoming more, more indulgent for boomers. But by the time Xers came along, it approached the point of complete underprotection. And when Xers did come along in the early 1960s, um, childhood sank, sank to the very bottom of society's priorities. But opinion polls showed that that uh, staying together for the sake of kids was no longer nearly as important as finding yourself and living the good life. Schools no longer seemed to function very well anymore. Families started breaking up. This was the opening wedge of the divorce revolution. Um, the entire culture, in many ways, turned anti-child. I should mention, too, that after 1963, we didn't want to even have kids anymore. That's when the fertility rate sank hugely. This became known as a baby bus generation, right? No, <laughs> you didn't want to have kids. Um, but the culture turned anti-child. It was hard to bring your kid into a restaurant back then. Uh, I remember, I grew up in California. I remember ZPG, which at that time, not today, but was a very much an anti-child uh, movement. I remember these little stickers people wore. I remember at the time, none is fun was one I remember. The, the other one was Jesus was an only child. That was my favorite. Um, <laughs> uh, one way I like to sum up this anti-child animus of this entire era is something I call a brief chronology of the evil child movie era, okay? <laughs> this was the most profitable genre of Hollywood movie for 20 years. That's why they all had spinoffs and sequels. You could not avoid packing a movie th theater with this image of, of children. And when these kids, and it exactly coincides with the early childhood of Generation X. It starts in the early 60s, came to a sudden end in the early 1980s. And when these kids weren't actually devouring older people, <laughs> they, were, they were annoyances. I don't know if you remember Kramer versus Kramer. They were just in the way. The Willy Wonka movie, you remember that? The original, they, they were just, you wanted to shoot them. They were so spoiled. <laughs> or, or Tatum O'Neill and Paper Moon, do you remember that movie? They were tough kids. You didn't want to hug these kids. And that was part of a point, actually, because when they were growing up, if older people were finding themselves, at the time it was thought the best way to raise kids was even in a very early age, teach them to take care of themselves as well. So they have a problem, you give them a self-care guide or a latchkey guide, right? Or you, you, what was very popular in child's literature was the new realism. Remember with Judy Bloom, Which remains really an icon for Generation X as they're growing older. They read Judy Bloom, and then they'll be happy to live in your house after that, you know. But the point is, the reason why this is important is, is that employers come to me today and they say, how is this generation, that my Generation X employees get to be the way they are? I say, I don't understand it. They don't trust, they don't trust the organization. They assume that no one is in charge. They think of life as a series of deals. You, you make personal deals with individuals and then you move on with no real continuity between them. Life is about choices, big choices and big risks. How did they get that 
perspective, and I say that perspective is not, nothing in the economy did that. That goes back to their childhood. That's their age, location, and history. That's where we were as a society. We're like trees. Generations are like trees. Inside us all, we have rings, you know, which indicate the wet summer, the dry winter, all of that. And we carry that stuff with us as we grow older. It shapes, it shapes who we are. It's interesting. I was recently in a gathering, a big gathering of millennial students. They were all around, you know, age uh, 16, 17, they were late high school students. And I, I said a few things about latchkey kids. A lot of the kids looked at, uh, gave me a look of puzzlement. I said, what's a latchkey kid? They all wanted to know. Interesting, isn't it? Every Xer knows what a latchkey kid is, right? But these millennials, they have no idea. What's a latchkey kid, right? So it's, and, and when you describe it to them, they, their first reaction is, there must be some kind of law about that, isn't there? <laughs> um, uh, I love looking at data. This is data from the UCLA freshman poll. And it's interesting. It, it's been, uh, these are uh, freshmen nationwide. And you can see that back in 1967, having a meaningful philosophy of life, as you would expect with boomer freshmen, right, was twice more uh, popular as a goal in life than being financially well off. But look how it changed. And my point here is, is that in politics, a two-to-one reversal is considered seismic. It almost never happens Do you see that big a reversal. But in generational change, we sometimes don't notice because it happens a bit more slowly. Uh, but when you, when you track these Xers, you can see uh, that there is, of course, when it comes to civic activity, this is the generation that opted out of politics. Uh, the lowest voter participation rates of every age bracket they've uh, entered. And uh, that's not to say they don't have a notion of civic activity, but it has to be one-on-one. -on -one. You help someone at a soup kitchen, you build a house for Habitat for Humanity, uh, that kind of activity. But you don't, that, you don't give the United Way. You don't, you don't necessarily vote or take part in, in, in overall party politics. Look at these headlines. Notice, this is the way Xers have been influenced in the commercial culture. Notice the difference in tone from the boomer ads, right? This is, ha this is how Xers have made their imprint. And, and one point to make here is that, um, is that when we look at Xers, is that when, when Xers entered adulthood in the early 1980s, you know, finally managed to survive the 70s, dazed and confused, right? They made it. Um, uh, it's amazing how a lot of that negative reputation carried over into the young adulthood. All kinds of reports in the 1980s about a young adult. They, don't, they can't read, they can't vote, they're materialistic, they're selfish, they're greedy. Uh, do you remember any of you the original Nation at Risk report in 1983, the clarion call for reform? right, just as Xers were emerging from our high schools. And they, the preamble to that report was this. Um, if a foreign power had, uh, had, uh, uh, had given us the kinds of students that are graduating from America's high schools today, we would consider it an act of war, okay. That's a nice warm welcome for Generation X, isn't it, you know? <laughs> but otherwise, you're great kids, you know. Um, but, I mean, that was the sense we had. And I want to say that among all of these negative predictions, so many of the positive attributes of that Generation X have been totally o overlooked. They're probably the most dynamic and productive generation in the economy to come along in at least a century. Productivity growth went down when boomers came into the workplace. But it's hugely revived with Generation X. They, they buy low, they sell high, they get the job done, they don't call attention to themselves, they certainly, certainly don't call for government uh, favors for themselves. And after 9-11, when everyone talks about resilience in America, right, we like to talk about what a resilient people we are, I think mainly they're talking about Generation X resilience. I mean, who was in the Twin Towers at that hour of the morning, mostly? You know, who was on the flight from Pittsburgh? Who was shipping out to Afghanistan the next week? It's Generation X, and I think Generation X doesn't get their due. There's no such thing as a good or bad generation. Every generation is what it has to be, and usually it turns out to be the generation we need at the time. Generational surprise, well, it changed high schools in the early 1980s. As we begin to notice. Remember John Hughes's, the John Hughes's movie like Risky Business and the Breakfast Club, rap music, MTV? That was the opening edge of the Generation X sensibility. Uh, on education, well, they didn't reject the system. They just got by without it. Would have been great if it were there. Uh, in an era of self-reliance and market-driven competition. And so many of the changes we've seen in the economy and society in the 80s and 90s really have been defined by Gen X young adults. 
to Gen Xers, a high school diploma is no longer valued, sufficient, maybe not even necessary. This is a generation that sees CEOs of a multi-billion dollar hip-hop industry with GEDs. I think of that. Uh, you get a diploma, you get any credential, only if you need it. Everything you just get if it's necessary. Nothing is really required. You strip everything down to its essentials in a wide open marketplace. You no longer need any markers just to sort of socially uh, 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 reinforce your identity. 